Um, I want to start off with your ideas and your questions that you I asked you to write at the beginning of class. And, and not in a particular order um, going around the room, but I'd rather you somebody just say one or ask a question or have, have an idea and just throw it out there and let other people jump in as they might. Because Jack might say something that's very similar to something Sam has to say, and that might be a great time for her, her to throw that in too. Um, or just to say, you know, ditto, kind of the same thing, or often almost the same thing, but a little variation on it. We'll You're going to start. Okay, so we're just going to do that. I want everyone to at, talk at least once, and, and maybe more if you'd like. So Oliver's going to start. Um, one of the questions I wrote down, what I was wondering about is kind of, um, in the first part, Radia, Radia, Raskolnikov is kind of um, introverty, introvert-esque. Um, yeah. Like he talked about not wanting to talk to people. And then after his little sickness, he goes out and he mentions wanting to, feeling the urge to go up and talk to people and feeling the urge to be sociable. So I was just kind of thinking about wondering why there's such a sudden change to um, being sociable. And Great. We're just going to hear questions and, and thoughts right now, so we're not going to go with this at the moment. We're going to come back to all of these, or at least most of them. So anybody else, just jump in. I'm not going to call on people. <laughs> so wait, we're adding new stuff to the new stuff? New stuff, yep. Oh, this is all okay. new stuff right, right. now. Ours is a quick clarification. Like, geographically, how close are they? Because he talked, Raskolnikov talked about how he was like, out walking for like six hours, mm -hmm. but then everything seems to be like in the same street or adjacent streets. It just got a little... Yeah, little model for me. Okay. Just jump in. Oh, uh, what's the origin or the history of the friendship between Raskolnikov and Razumi Ken? Razumi Ken. Okay. Dimitri. <laughs> Well, so uh, dependent. <laughs> like, yeah. I was going um, to say, like, is there a reason why he's so hostile, and um, why does Razumi Ken continue to like give or like be kind to him? It makes me wonder about their history. Mine's like really specific, but on page 133, they talk about Zamyotov. Zamyotov? Yeah, Zamyotov. talking about ha him having an open palm, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering what that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, I wondered how Raskolnikov's illness played into the story, other than the fact that he was just sick. Um, I was wondering like, why more people haven't suspected Raskolnikov or why they haven't made a bigger push to investigate him as a suspect. I was curious as to what his dream about his landlady getting beaten up by the policeman in the bigger scheme of things. Sorry, say that again? Oh, what this, about that dream? Just, just what, <coughs> what exactly it meant. Okay. I was kind of wondering about why Raskolnikov or Marmaladov died. I was kind of wondering if it was just to help him plot along or if there was some symbology or allegory to his demise. I was wondering about Louisa Ivanovna, the German person in the police station, and if she has any meaning at all. You might stump me on that one. Um, I was confused why, well, not confused, but wondering why Raskolnikov is so intent about paying for a doctor for Marmol. He says it a lot. He says it like five times. I was kind of confused by why he gave money to that girl outside the, I guess it was like a tavern. <clears throat> um, when I was reading the second part, I noticed that um, I guess it was more like the second part was focusing on the question of whether or not that act made him not human anymore. Because I noticed a lot of things like um, there was the novel that his friend was translating is woman human. I mean, is is so and so human? I think that's a pretty important phrase. And I noticed I noted in my notebook a lot of instances. I didn't give any detail because I'm silly. About um, I kept referencing human, human, human all over the place. So. Um, I was wondering about how like kind of every interaction Raskolnikov has, um, every person he interacts with, they all really question like what's going on mentally with him. Uh, like Nastasia um, is 
asking him like what like what's going on, but and uh, and he goes to the police station and he kind of believes like he's been discovered and so he has this weird like argument with a policeman where they both like talk about like who's being rude here and like he runs into who was it um, Zamitov uh, at like the restaurant and basically every interaction he has he comes so close to confessing that it makes me wonder like was he really like the overmatch that he thought he was mm -hmm. yeah. working off that I was wondering why it, if he's purposely trying to get close to being like figured out um, and if he's trying to give people a chance to like catch him on his error and turn him in. Mm -hmm. Yep. And a considerable amount of cockiness. Yeah. He has um, not always but sometimes. Can the Ubermensch like feel guilt and still be the Ubermensch? Is it possible to be, a, be the ultimate Superman and still feel guilt for your actions, or are those like mutually exclusive? We have a few more, and then um, I was like wondering, kind of why he keeps going back and forth between kind of different states of mind. Where there's times where he's sure the police are on to him, and he starts worrying about the evidence, and then there's other times where you know he kind of even forgets about the murder and. He doesn't even, it doesn't even kind of pop into his mind, and so I, I wonder why he keeps going back and forth between those two states. Yeah, I don't know. It's similar. I was wondering about why he seems to have this really abrupt change in like his health and also his personality once he finds Marmela's dog. Like mm -hmm. he becomes this really kind and generous person, like offering to pay for the doctor and being really nice to his children, mm -hmm. and then like immediately afterwards, he becomes really weak again. Uh I was curious as to why he uh, referred to himself as servant of God when talking with uh, mm -hmm. Planko Pelechka. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember which it is. Yes. But after uh, the whole incident with Marmodov. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the height of his cockiness or self importance. Um, when he leaves the Marmodovs. I was wondering if um, Marmodov's uh, death by the cart and the horse had anything to do with his dream about the mayor in part one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just curious about whether Luis and the fiancé was supposed to be such a bad guy or whether that's kind of just what Raskolnikov is perceiving. Mm -hmm. um. I was kind of wondering, like, the different punishments that he faces and just kind of the different, uh, like, how they kind of affect him and what are the different, all the different punishments that he faces throughout the mm -hmm. Maybe one more, if there's one. Um, I was thinking about um, Skolnikov's, like, relationship with alcohol. Um, he drinks a lot, but you don't really seem to ever know decisively if he's drunk or not, but he, his actions definitely change. When he's around that phone. Yeah, he seems kind of. Also, talks about being repulsed by the drunkards. Right. Um, to, mm -hmm. so I think some of it. Being around it is somewhat cultural. Which is the same in the same way. I was kind of repulsed by the kind of. Poor dre poorly dressed people in part one, mm -hmm. of which he is one of. Yeah. yeah he certainly is. Yeah. Um, Sam, will you pass this on? I just gave Simon these notes that I, I put together, uh, and <coughs> they won't answer all, all of these. They'll answer a lot of these, and um, a lot of these I think we can kind of group together and talk about. Um, a lot of you talked about, I'm going to try and group these up and talk about them all in the next 25 minutes or so. A lot of you talked about some erratic behavior or uh, change in motivation, change in plans, um, forgetting about the murder, then being obsessed with the murder. Um, in some way, I mean, that this first page of the notes is kind of about that. It, I just, I, I've, t I've kind of moved a lot of notes around, trying to reorganize this into a, w a way to kind of digest it. But if we look at a bunch of things here about this Kolokov's loss of control um, and its battle 
with his own self-importance. So that idea of being self-important, thinking you're the one who gets to make all the decisions, uh, right in line with the Ubermensch theory, um, he abides by and he subscribes to most of the time, but he certainly loses control over that. Sometimes he does lose control in almost a, a conscious way uh, a, a, that he's a kind of a, has a deft hand in almost losing control. Like, does he, I don't know if it was Ryan who asked, does he want to get caught um, or does he want to just taunt people with almost getting caught? Um, I think he's, he, he's lost in all of that. He's lost in sometimes he wants total control. He doesn't want anybody else to know. Sometimes he doesn't have control. And sometimes, just to make this very complicated, he is feeling so sure about himself and you know, positive that he won't be figured out that he's taunt, he, he can taunt others. As the novel moves on, his faculties and his awareness and his ability to control and know how far to go and how far not to go all diminish and those lines get blurred. And so we talk about liminal space and the edges of things and that becomes important. And he starts to lose control over that. So it becomes more and more obvious, uh, if it isn't already, to folks kind of what's going on with this guy, maybe why it's going on. So one question came up that relates to that already saying, why isn't he, why don't more people think he's guilty of this murder? Um, and um, I don't know if I, uh, and if you flip to the second page here, the title of these notes say, The New Wave of Police Work. So um, the quote here is on, from page 130. It says, I'm not talking about evidence now. I'm talking about the, the question about how they understand their essence. Um, this whole idea, now we're used to it. We, we turn on the television and watch any number of you know, CSI or CSI type films. And so much of that phrase you hear, psychological profiling. Um, that's what I mean by the new wave of police work. That idea of understanding someone's essence or understanding motivation and their intent was a new thing. I mean, a new way of doing police work. And it is a. Uh, before it was really just about, I mean, there, there, were ev there was evidence. Uh, if someone confessed, they were guilty. Um, that's what the painter gets caught up with a little bit. There's evidence there that leads him to them. So with Raskolnikov, he has done a good job of hiding the physical evidence, not necessarily his kind of mental deterioration. Um, so because most, and, and if, you, if you're kind of aware of that now, the more you read the text and listen to some of the police in particular talk about how they find suspects, there's going to be great diversion views, most of which are going to talk about evidence. If there's not physical evidence, then nothing happened. Um, there's a guy who's referenced, I think, on page 133. I don't know why I'd remember that off the top of my head. Um, they talk about this house party that's happening, uh, and this guy named Porfiry Petrovich is supposed to be there. Pretty unimportant name to us so far. Really important name to us going forward. Um, he's a detective with the police, and he's He's the most interested of all the police in this idea of psychological profiling. He doesn't even care about evidence. He, he, he's obsessed with the idea, of, it's a, he's like the anti-Ubermensch idea guy. That if you've done something, fine. I'm just going to kind of wait you out. I know what you did, and I'm going to let you get to a place in time where you come to me and you tell me what you did. Because I believe that the guilt will, you know, rot to you um, so much that you can't be able to handle it uh, and we'll look for kind of um, a release from that in some way. And I'm careful about I guess a wording around admitting to the guilt because if Raskolnikov and he does have intentions during this part to go admit to the crime there's different ways to do that um if you talk about from an intrinsic perspective, are you just admitting to the crime because you are uh, sick of the guilt and in some ways you're, you want to be 
selfish. You don't want that burden on you anymore. You just want to say, hey, look, I did it. Deal with the repercussions, but I'm sick of this feeling that I have right now. Or is it more than that? Do you really feel deep down in a kind of a whole being sense that you've done something wrong, that you have transgressed and you believe that? Uh, and is it an acceptance of that? Now that might be cutting hairs a little bit, but that's, that's delineating some lines here between transgression versus committing a crime, uh, Porfiry Petrovich wouldn't be happy if he just got the evidence and convicted Ruskolnikov. He wants that kind of moral being to kind of um, awaken or wear Ruskolnikov's defenses down enough. So um, he does maybe admit guilt initially, but then ultimately kind of be remorseful without regret. I think we can all relate to times where we felt remorseful, but you know, sometimes we use the word "but," right? But that, you know, I had this idea. But it, so he, I think he's interested, in, in the novel's interested in um, not just a confession, but at what point do we get to kind of a, a, the totality of giving up on the ideas you had? in all ways without any strings attached in some way like the little biography that we started class with like can you get to a place where you have you kind of give up on that life that you had totally and, and think anew about something be reborn in, in some ways to use that phrase um, any thoughts or questions on that those ideas it's kind of like Nikolai though some yeah. So, you know, he confesses and he like, tries to commit suicide and stuff. Yeah. And I'm curious to know if what's the name Porphyry? Mm -hmm. uh, how he would react to that. Yeah. You know, he, this guy's confessing and he feels terrible and he's trying to commit suicide. You know, yeah. Is that convincing? And even also the evidence of the earrings, you know. Mm -hmm. as well, so. so, in the structure of the novella, or the, not the novella, but the novel, um, has a great foil to Raskolnikov because he has all the guilt that Raskolnikov doesn't, or at least is ready to, to give it, uh, to, to say he's guilty. Um, and in terms of the plot structure, it is a little bit of like a red herring where it gets people off track. They say, oh, you know, that's wrapped up. We've got our guy. That's where Porphyry comes in. And as we get to understand him more, or really understand him uh, for the first time, um, He'll pick up on that. He'll just say, this doesn't make sense. This was too easy. Um, and kind of understand Mikolai as this self-obsessed, so wanting to, you know, I talked about the role of suffering in Russian Orthodox Christianity a little bit, and here you have somebody who's like looking for ways to suffer. Um, Skolnikov is too. It's just harder to pick up on. Um, so Mikolai, you know, wasn't maybe his first choice, but then when he's kind of trapped there, he, his way out is just to say, yes, I, you know, I did it, I'm sorry, I want to kill myself. Um, but it's the evidence that points to him first. It's not a, a, a psychological kind of profiling. Although people are starting to get interested in risk coming off a bit. Um, so some other things on this front page. Um, so he is cocky. Uh, he is insecure. Um, he does seem to have some disorder within himself. Um, you know, page, you know, you have these kind of pretty heavy moments of narration, like on page 103, a dark sensation of tormenting infinite solitude and estrangement suddenly rose to consciousness in his soul. I mean, that's no small thing. Um, but there is this palpable disorder. Um, and, you know, we talk about, I talk about liminal space a little bit on the following page, but I could talk about it here, too, um, that he's on the edge of things. So if he's, you know, that illness that he feels. Um, Ryan, was that a question you had about illness? I make uh, yeah. What did I, you say? I just... I Is it symbolic? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, before the novel starts, there's evidence that he has already come down some chills and fevers. 
it certainly is in a very different place now than it was. But so too did he already have the idea about killing that woman. Yeah, I was thinking along the lines of is another name for tuberculosis consumption. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if his uh, guilt would eventually consume him and if that was tuberculosis or not. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, kind of, they're synonymous. Skolnikov doesn't have yeah, 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 he just seems to be in... He's really in and out of delirium. Um, if you didn't pick up on it, uh, by chapter two in this part, when Raskolnikov is out, really, this is, he does faint at the police station, and he comes to fairly quickly. That's in part one. But part two is where he is just laid up on, on his bed or um, couch for four days, in and out of consciousness, and he basically doesn't get up. Um, and this, too, is a moment where um, sorry, by the end of chapter two he falls asleep and, and chapter three is really him there for four days. And at that moment, while we look at him and kind of analyze him from the, you know, obviously the outside of the text, you have all of these characters who start showing up and they are looking at him, right? You have Nastasia coming up uh, initially. Um, she came up with the caretaker who tried to deliver that summons. Uh, you have the landlady at least peering in the door. You have the mom hearing about this and sending money. Uh, you have Zaz and Mav Zamyatov. You have Zomakin. Um, you have Lucian later on uh, in this part, of, not in this chapter, but later on. He shows up. Um, you have all these people who show up to Raskolnikov's place to kind of inspect him in some way. You have other characters later on in the text who do the same. Um, just interesting, I think, to consider. Um, any other questions based on kind of some of this conversation so far? Yeah, Zach? So if his uh, physical illness can be kind of correlated or seen as a figurative uh, you know, almost analogous to his mental kind of wasting. Yeah. Uh, and he was inspected, and people didn't see anything like seriously wrong with him. They just thought he was ill. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of mean that mentally or morally he he was also kind of inspected and found to not be guilty as well? Or um, no, I'd say almost the opposite. I, you know, and this is from somebody who, who has read the whole novel several times. Um, I think it's ultimately probably a mark against just the fact greater that. society of like not recognizing uh, the so it's almost like yeah a little bit I mean not recognizing the urgency of, of, of breaking kind of this moral, moral code and kind of what that can do to somebody okay um, So I talked about this this cockiness a little bit, um, and I said this earlier. He he's he seems most self assured when he leaves the Marmalades um, after helping, right? and he does. And this kind of goes into the a little bit of the bit about he just wants to pay. He just wants to pay. There's all this like forced conversation or acts of like giving money. Ironically, he's. He is given money on the streets earlier in this part. Um, he's mistaken for a peasant, or like a homeless person. Um, and it's another time where the, the plot direction has totally kind of shifted. Um, he enters into, is it chapter, yeah, chapter eight. Um, chapter eight begins with him leaving his um, apartment and he is on the way to the police station with all the attention to turn himself in. Uh, and is at this moment where he comes across Semyon Marmeladov lying in the street having been hit by the carriage. Um, and it totally changes things. Obviously there's the whole episode at the house. Um, I think it's symbolically important to understand that who enters this house, there's a doctor, there's a priest, there's a policeman. They talk about different facets of our Society and, and there are things that you know we are looking at too: morality, criminality, 
uh, spirituality. And those facets are all represented there as Marmaladoff dies, and none of them can do anything. If there's anyone that can do anything, maybe it's Raskolnikov bringing them in, um, but it seems more that uh, it's Sonya who, who offers some kind of solace uh, during his death, um, even in that kind of reek and wink of Katarina, who's just nasty, uh, yelling at him as he dies about how he's worthless. Um, but then, who, so somebody asked a question about Marmadoff's death. And, okay, so now knowing that, and what I've told you is that Sonya and Raskolnikov become in, intrinsically important to one another. So we do want to pay attention to what's going on with the greater Marmadoff family, and now father's dead, and so mom is the only one left. Now that's not Sonia's mother. It is the mother of the three young children there. Um, but she's kind of the adult figure in that house and not only is she growingly unhinged um, but we know that she does have consumption or tuberculosis so that should only continue to an end point of, of death. So, you know, if that plays out, then what do we have? Then we have Sonia and these three kids. And so, like, how, you know, how does that work if, if Sonia is needed somehow in, in Raskolnikov's narrative? Um, and I don't want to give too much weight, but that's important to kind of keep track of. Um, where, do these narr where are these narratives? And how? what's preventing these narratives from totally, you know, joining forces in that? story here as well. Um, the dream. The third dream comes up in, in so I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, I think there, I've got some notes on it. So dream three, uh, I think it's on uh, I think we'll have three, two, three, third page. This is the third dream in the novel. Um, what are the first two? One of them is in there. The mayor. The, the, the Egypt. Yeah. Egypt. Africa. Egypt or Africa or some oasis. That's how it's described. Yeah. Um, here's dream three. Um, and the dream essentially is Lieutenant uh, Ilya Petrovich, which he met earlier that day at the police, or earlier a few days ago at the police station uh, is on the stairs uh, beating his landlady and some crowd is gathering outside. Um, there's almost no narrative denotation to us that the dream begins. Uh, and I wrote, in fact, that there's some kind of misleading narration that ours, Raskolnikov is actually awake. Uh, we all we only find out later and really have to be convinced by Nastasia uh, in some ways, but he's being convinced as well that he was sleeping and that was a dream. So on page 115, the narrator says he, he lay down on the sofa, pulled a great coat over him, and immediately sank into oblivion. That's the end of the paragraph. The next paragraph starts, in the dark of evening, he was jolted back to consciousness by terrible shouting. We come to find out later that that is part of his dream, that he was jolted back awake. Um, and I think this next thing says, this next bullet point, that we do have to be coaxed back to believing that this is a dream by Nastasia on the following page, um, which is confusing to us, but should experientially or mimetically put us in a place to understand Raskolnikov's um, liminal spaces between consciousness and subconsciousness and dreams and reality becoming blurrier and blurrier, uh, and as he's kind of um, frantic and losing his own control of his faculties. Sometimes we lose that with him uh, in the novel uh, by reading and, and being confused and being kind of reminded later that that wasn't happening or that was part of his kind of subconscious. So this whole idea, you know, Porfiry Petrovich uh, kind of epitomizes the police, uh, the part of the police that is interested in this psychological evaluation of criminals but so too is Dostoevsky I mean that's the nature of this whole novel of, to evaluate the inside of 
how somebody works morally and psychologically, um, and what has control over what ultimately. Um, uh, there were a couple questions about Raskolnikov and Razumikin's relationship. Uh, they created a relationship in school or university together. Um, and Razumikin, uh, I think the, the, the translation of his name is reasonable, the word reasonable. Um, he is a, a man of reason. He is like, he's a rock uh, for Raskolnikov in this novel. He is kind of unwavering. Um, He's kind. Um, he's not, you know, and because he doesn't change, he's not that much of a dynamic character. Maybe not at all, but that's fine. Um, it is a nice, in some way, another foil to Raskolnikov, who is constantly changing. It was nice one moment and, and or, you know, killing someone at the next moment. Um, but I mean, Rizovkin's important. He is a connection to the family, ultimately. Um, He's helped already manipulate some of that money that came in from his mom. Um, he does develop this kind of liking for his own sister when they show up in town, which they do by the end of uh, this part. Um, by the end of part two, right, Miss mom and sister are there. Um, so there's a lot going on.